Welcome back, fellow humans, carnivores, would-be carnivores, omnivores. I'm Colin Stuckert, the Wild CEO. Should you be a carnivore or an omnivore? Are humans primarily carnivores or omnivores? I'm gonna address all this in today's video. We're gonna go a little bit in depth to some of the different points so that you can figure out what is the best, most optimal eating strategy for yourself. All right, let's get to the principles first because to understand anything, you need to build on top of your first principles, your fundamentals, the things that you know for sure that we can agree on. When we get to that point where we can agree on something, we can build things on top. And every time we can build something else that we agree on, we get a little bit higher to understanding and truth. So the first things first, humans evolved as omnivores. We ate anything we could find in the wild, food, plants, nuts, seeds, animals, organs, anything that was edible to the human was game. And we would have eaten it. We were opportunistic omnivores. That's principle number one. Principle number two, in that setting, every single food that our ancestors ate before the advent of agriculture came from the wild herself. Principle number two, you cannot dispute this. This is irrefutable. Before the advent of processed food and this and that, and being able to transport food all over the world, before that infrastructure was in place, before we even started farming and being able to grow food, humans went into the wild, walked around 13 to 15 miles a day, hunted and foraged for food. The third principle, Humans cannot survive in the wild without eating animals. You cannot. You cannot get the essential nutrition. You cannot even get enough calories from the plant food kingdom that you can from animals. Hunting and cooking, especially animals, were the two things that allowed our ancestors to grow big brains and then work together in small tribes, small bands of humans, and then basically dominate the food chain. This is irrefutable, undisputable. Some might try to dispute it, but they'll have very weak arguments. So this is the first principle of human evolution and biology. Four, plants have defense mechanisms. Plants have things inside chemistry that attack organisms, predators that try to eat it or that do eat it. And to what extent this goes, how much the effect is, which they're targeting, etc. There's obviously limitless variables here, but one thing we can agree on is plants have internal defense mechanisms, this is well understood. Animals have generally external or effort-based defense mechanisms. Maybe they have claws, teeth, whatever. Maybe they hide, camouflage, they run, they even try to eat you. Plants can't move or do anything, so it has to build things internally. Animals have the mobility and they can kind of fight back. So if you look at evolution and you look at what is a predator and prey's defense strategy, you can see that animals didn't have to build things inside their body, so they instead built claws, teeth, maybe certain poisons, things like that. They built things as a defense strategy that were usually generally based on doing something or being able to move. Plants can't move, so it had to build its defense mechanisms inside. Irrefutable, simple stuff. Five, many species, and this includes humans, but many species, bears, birds, small mammals, use fruit and other plant foods before winter to fatten up for winter when food was more scarce. Some would try to debate that humans aren't exactly the same this way. I call bollocks on that. In fact, there's a really good book I'm reading, Don't Eat for Winter, right here. Excellent book that defines this, goes into this, and it makes a lot of sense considering that when food is the most ripe, the most fructose, and the most sugar is right before winter. And what does that do? It fattens you up. This is nature's way of fattening up. It's also nature's way of getting a mammal, for example, a bear or human, to eat that fruit Expel the seeds, those seeds get spread somewhere. That's that plant's replication strategy. When you really look into this stuff and you, and you dive a little bit deep, you start seeing connections where, okay, that makes sense, that makes sense. This is the ancestral mindset. This is what I'm trying to help you do on this channel. Build this so you can understand these things so that if you see some really bad research or some guy on TV claiming something, you can be like, well, that doesn't really add up under my evolutionary framework. So I bet they're just grasping at straws or they're trying to make inferences based on epidemiology or whatever. I don't need to listen to this person. Or I can take that and file that away, and if other data shows up that might support that or some other thing I'm not considering, then I can think about it. That's critical thinking. It's not just blindly accepting somebody on TV that sounds smart and then saying, oh, well, research this, research that, and then saying, oh, well, I gotta change my mind now because this person says so. I know, I'll stay on point, or I'll go off on a crazy tangent, okay? All right, sixth principle. No human had access to plant foods, or especially like a specific plant or food, on a consistent basis. Like I said, humans were nomadic hunter-gatherers. They roamed around and whatever nature offered up to them, whatever they could find is what they ate. And if they came across some honey, they would gorge, get as many of those calories in as possible. If they came across an apple tree, they'd probably pick it dry and eat as much as they could. If they came across a big kill, 
They'd eat every single part of it, but they couldn't have chosen to do so. They weren't growing monocrops where you can harvest at a certain time every year and then have that food available and eat that consistently. So back to our original point, humans evolved as omnivores with a big focus on cooking and animal foods because we needed animal foods to survive. There's certain vitamins and minerals, also the calories. You just need the calories. You need the fat, you need the protein, et cetera. And that's actually another point I didn't think about. Protein is a building block of light. There's a lot of research that shows that humans will actually eat until they get enough protein. So they gotta get protein satiety. And then anything they're eating until then, they basically just go through until they have enough protein. This is why protein is the most satiating nutrient you can eat. Think about it. You have a big steak or a couple chicken breasts and you gobble those down first. Give yourself a minute for your brain to kind of signal that that's in there. You're not gonna be hungry for anything. And this is why if you're trying to lose weight or anything, prioritize protein, eat more protein, and then fill in the gaps with other foods. And I promise you, you'll reach your every health goal. So humans evolved in the wild as omnivore hunter-gatherers. Today, humans live in a modern environment. Modern environment has food available year round, anything you want forever. You could quite literally eat one food every single day, every single meal for the rest of your life. Hunter-gatherer, wild, Whatever was around, change with the season, change with the location, you ate that, and if nothing else was available, you fasted, and you just kept going and going and going. Okay, that was the strategy for our ancestors, and guess what, we're here today, so it worked out. So let's visit Darwin real quick. Darwin's theory of natural selection is that the species that best adapts to its environment passes along its genes to the next generation, and thus is more likely to evolve and adapt, evolve and adapt. Humans today, 50% plus obesity rate are not adapting to an environment where food is always available, where it's primarily a plant-based carb-heavy food environment. These same people would have done fine in the wild because they would have been forced to eat on a certain schedule and eat certain things and not eat certain things. Today, we get to choose what we want to eat and our biology is not designed for an environment where we can choose food. And again, like nobody talks about this. This is, in my opinion, this is first principle 101 stuff by just understanding a little bit about ancestral evolutionary biology and psychology, a little bit about the timeline of history. When was the first writing? When did we start farming, et cetera? Like these things are at this point accepted as scientific fact, yet they get ignored because somebody wants to have a published study as if that's the only way to infer truth. And it's not. And it's actually a really bad way to find truth. Science itself and research itself is supposed to just give you ideas that you can then test through interventional studies, through testing yourself. Yet nobody talks about this. Publis research is this. Somebody literally told me data is data and referring to science. And I was making the point that there's a lot of really bad science. There's a lot of really manipulated data. There's even fraud. There's retractionwatch.com that shows the top papers that have been cited the most that have actually been retracted. Yet most of that research that is citing those papers has not been retracted. Like people have no idea what goes on in peer review and research and science and academia. They just accepted the appeal to authority bias. This person has a lab coat, they're at a prestigious university, they're an expert, therefore they know what they're talking about. But any college students that might be watching this, go talk to some of your left-leaning liberal professors about their views on the world, on history and whatever, and you will realize just how fragile their worldview is, but I won't get into that. So if the species that best adapts to its environment survives and passes along its genes, what does that mean for modern humans? And this is the question we have to answer today. It means that hunter-gatherers in the wild an omnivore-based approach, you ate what was available, that's what you were supposed to do. And at some certain times of the year, you might get fatter. If there's more fruit and whatever, you fatten up and then in the winter, you burn it off. This is what humans are good at doing. This is why it's so easy to gain weight and it's so hard to lose weight because we're in a food-rich environment. And that's really the distinction that you need to think about and how to figure this out for yourself, right? So if you live in the environment today where food's always available, is it better to have an omnivore approach or a carnivore approach. And, I, and when I say this, I'm saying mostly, I'm not saying really purely, all right? So I'm gonna give you some principles on how to think about this for yourself. And then I'm gonna give you my conclusion at the end of the video, we're gonna get to it. If you're already carnivore, or you've been a carnivore, you tried it, you probably know what the best answer to this is. The reason people are getting insane results on carnivore diet. I get comments all the time, 50 pound weight loss, 70 pound weight loss. People are taking their health into their own hands and getting results that their doctors, that big pharma, that surgery could never get them. But they're not getting reported in the research, are they? And they're not getting used as a data point. And that just, pisses me off, but it is what it is. The best approach in a food-rich, carb-rich, plant-rich food environment is way closer to a carnivore diet. And I'm gonna tell you exactly how I think about this and exactly what I do in a moment. But this is very simple. The best strategy for the modern human is an animal-based, ancestrally appropriate way of eating that includes food from nature, real food, comprised of mostly animal products, nose to tail, 
and if and only if one can tolerate them, certain plant foods. So I've covered other videos about like whether you should go strict carnivore or not. I'll give you a basic uh, synopsis of that. I'm going to give you a few bullet points on how to think about this. This is a question you have to answer for yourself. Here's what I do first, and then we'll get to that list. I eat fruit when I feel like it. I do dairy on my flexible carnivore-based diet. I'll have some nuts, seeds, salad, or other plant foods if I feel like it or if it's around, though they do bring me less satisfaction in general than animal foods. And that's fine. I'm okay with that. I love me some gluten-free lentil or rice pasta, and I throw in a ton of cheese, cream, and butter. It's my like once a week go-to if I've been low carb or whatever. And I'll have some bad pizza every so often. I still have a penchant for gluten, uh, not gluten-free, but um, uh, stuffed crust. Stuffed crust pizza. Growing up, I thought it was the coolest idea. The commercials, you saw the celebrities turn around, eat it backwards. It was probably one of the most genius marketing campaigns I've ever seen. I, to this day, I still think about stuffed crust pizza and I still visualize those commercials. It's insane. So I follow a 16-8 fasting protocol with two meals during my feeding window. My first meal is always my biggest meal. It's almost always a steak. And I usually have that 46 hours after I wake up. For you, because that's what I do, how are you going to think about this so that you can build like what that percentage carnivore you want to be is and what that percentage, if any, omnivore do you want to be? So the first thing you have to ask is how do plant foods affect you? Are you like Michaela Peterson where you eat like a few olives and your symptoms flare up for 20 days and you have depression, and arthritis, and all these things like this? She talked about that on the Ancestral Mind podcast you can find up here. You probably should do strict carnivore if that's the case. Do you struggle with weight loss or maintenance? Are you constantly battling that? Then you want to buy as much as the carnivore end of the spectrum while optimizing protein and controlling your fat intake as much as possible while obviously using a dose of intermittent fasting. Plants are the carb end of the spectrum. They're what are designed, as I talked about, preparing you for winter. Carbs are meant to fatten you up. If carbs were available in nature, we would have gorged. That fat that we would have gained, our body is efficient at storing that fat through carbs, was a survival mechanism. But in a world where there's carbs and food available all the time, it is now a threat to health. Do you enjoy certain foods or not really? Like, do you like certain plant foods or not really? Because if you don't, don't eat them. Who cares? It's fine. Do you enjoy the simplicity of your diet or do you like cooking, including a lot of different things together? I will sometimes make a dish. Maybe it's like a, a garlic, lemon, shrimp, scampi or something. And maybe I'll put over gluten-free pasta or maybe not. But I might put different spices in there, garlic, anything like that. Like these to me is not even really vying off a carnivore diet. I'm cooking these things down. They're low toxin things, usually a lot of water content. They add some flavor. I'm not using a ton of them. To me, that's just like ideal. And so now for some completely made up ranges that I figured out for myself that you can maybe use as a guidepost. I recommend most people do 30 to 35% of their calories from protein. I won't get into why that is. I got a bunch of videos on that. Look in the video tab if you want more information on that. I probably do an average about 10 to 15% of my calories from carbs. But again, this is not on a daily basis. So I'll have days where I might have like five to 10 grams of carbs and I'll just have a lot of meat and fat and protein. And there might be days where I have some gluten-free pasta and I'm literally 150 to 200 grams carbs. Yesterday, we had gluten-free pasta and I cheated with some Moose Tracks ice cream. I ate mostly one meal and then I ate some protein when I got home to kind of fill it out and whatever. Like today I'm probably gonna have no carbs. And then tomorrow I'll get back to my baseline where I might have a few bites of a fruit or this and that, or I might have, if there's some veggies there, leftover sweet potato, I might have that and that's it. I don't try to add carbs for the sake of adding carbs. I just kind of eat them if they're around and I want them. And then I just focus on my animal-based, carnivore diet-based way of eating. So I do what I want. If I want a cheat meal, it doesn't wreck me as much as it used to. I will say, if you're just starting out a carnivore diet, cheat meals in the beginning can kind of throw a wrench in there. But once you adapt, your gut heals, you get all those beneficial microbes, you can, you, from what I've seen, and I've talked to other carnivores on this, you usually can do okay if you have pizza one day or this one day or whatever. You're going to have to figure out what those foods are though. Because if pizza destroys you or if a thing of olives destroys you like it does for Michaela Peterson, then don't eat those. Like what I can do, what you can do, they're not the same thing. And so what I'm going to start doing after writing this all down and kind of thinking about it, I'm going to start probably promoting this a bit more, but I'm going to say I am a 80% carnivore and 20% omnivore. I think that's a good way to think about it. Now, if you want to do like 5% omnivore and only have like a certain list of foods that you add in every so often, if you want to do just cheat meals and that's when you have your planned foods, literally it's up to you. Okay. You got to find the best system for yourself. But I will say in our current environment, the species that best adapts is one that can avoid the always on-demand plant foods, the grains, the carbs, the sugar, and can focus on animal-based nutrition. That is, without a doubt, irrefutable, a first principle of the modern human. And with that, 
I'm going to let you go. If you want more videos like this, hit that subscribe button. If you have any questions or comments, put it below. Help other people that are going to watch this video because this video is going to be here for years on end. And a lot of people are going to come to it and get value. So if you have anything constructive to add, please put it there or a question, put it there and I'll get to it. I'll see you in the next one. Hey, hey, Colin here. Got a freebie for you. Click on the button below to go to the ancestralmind.com and download the seven principles of living wild. This is a short PDF that's got some of the main principles such as real food, sleep, movement, and a couple more that are going to help you live more ancestrally in accordance with your genes.